Lord God, we are your people. This morning, we stand here as your children, as heirs, as um, stakeholders, as part-time owners of the kingdom of God. And, um, and we come here this morning, Lord, to uh, get the payment that you have promised. You have promised your people that we can have as much of you as we want, and we want a lot. Lord God, fill us up this morning. Allow us to hear you speaking to us through your word. Bless the preaching of your word, that it might be a thing that comes from you, not from any human being, certainly not from me and that you would tune the ears of our hearts to not just hear you, but to have the strength and the audacity to obey. And that we might be known as people who don't just know the word of God, who do the word of God. And that we might see a great and wonderful change in our city, in our state, in our country, in our world, because of a few people being obedient to you, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to sort of ask this question, kind of motivate my sermon this morning. What are we even doing? Um, What is the church even doing? What are we as God's people even doing? What, what's the purpose of being a Christian? And I don't mean like theologically. What, what I mean is just like, what, what, are we, what are we even doing? What are we aiming for? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, a lot of people sort of think about the Christian faith as being a good person. And if you ask the average person on the street, I think, in today's culture, um, are you a Christian? If they said yes, and you said, well, what, what are you doing? What are Christians doing? They would say something like, just being good people and going to heaven when we die. You know, that's what we're doing. Um, and so if you sort of buy into that, that Christianity is really a, uh, a moral code that isn't too heavy. You know, it's a, a moral code that you can do because you get forgiveness for all of your sins. And so you're right with God. And then your life can be about whatever you need it to be about because so you got your, your sins covered. And then every little bit of Christianity that you're like going to add on to that, whether that's, you know, tithing, being a blessing, um, going out of your way to help people, whatever. Those are sort of like just racking up extra credit points, if you know what I mean. It's like, you don't have to do that. It's good to do that. It feels good to do that, to serve, that kind of thing. Um, but, but like what I'm doing is just, I'm just trying to mind my own beeswax. I'm just trying to be a good person and, uh, you know, let go and let God. And, um, and I think that that is basically the large majority of evangelical Christians in our world today. Um, and you know, that's not old. Um, I, excuse me, that's not new. That, that's old. <laughs> when we can change the purpose of what we're doing and why we're even here on this earth to be something like, Oh, well, we're waiting for something that's already been promised. I'm like, we aren't doing much except for, you know, I need to keep my reputation intact with people at church. Eventually, it's like, why even bother with those people? I, who cares what they think, right? Me and God, I'm, we're good. What do, I, what, do I need, what do I need you all for? Unless you're going to go out of your way to help me in my relationship with God, which, let's be honest, not a lot of that's happening. And so, like, what do I need the church for? I can do being a good person on my own time. Or are they going to read the, I can read, I can read the Bible on my own time. Uh, believe it or not, like, there are better preachers than your preacher uh, available on YouTube that you can listen to during the week. It was like, what's so special about this group of people? And honestly, the church is full of people who've got their own troubles and issues, and the church hurts a lot of people. Like, what are we even doing? Why, why church at all? 
Um, why, why people of God, I'm a person of God, I belong to God, me and God were good, I'm doing my best to be a good person, and at the end, when I get to the pearly gates, I've got this ticket that, like, hey, I'm a Christian, you got to let me in. And, uh, and I'll point to my extra credit pile right over here, you know, if I need to put an addition onto my mansion in heaven, whatever it might be. You see, the point that I'm trying to make is that, that if you can't answer the question, what are we even doing? What's our purpose? Why are we here? Then everything else kind of becomes negotiable. This is a very old thing, very, very old thing. And, um, and the failure usually does not start actually in the pew. The failure usually starts in the pulpit. It's actually the leaders of the church who fail first. And then when they stop... Um, understanding their purpose and going hard after their purpose, then the people of God become kind of listless. It's like a boat without a motor. A boat without a motor, without sails, without oars, is just driftwood shaped like a boat, you know. And so uh, Paul is writing to Timothy. Now, Paul is an old pastor. He also happens to be one of the apostles. Um, and, and God's using him powerfully to do a bunch of things. And he leaves Timothy in charge of the church at Ephesus, and he hears some things that are going on in Ephesus that makes Paul concerned. And so 1 Timothy is actually not written to the church, it's written to the pastor. And like, of course, it's good for the church to read it as well. Paul's afraid of a certain type of leadership error that is called passivity. And so, let me, verse 3 of chapter 6. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. So you have to be aware that what Paul is aiming at right here with this young pastor Timothy is you need to be aware of your doctrine. And there's going to be people who come in who aren't teaching what I've been teaching who aren't teaching what Jesus has been teaching. They're going to invent a new purpose for Christianity. They're going to invent a new purpose for your church, for your congregation, for your family, and you're going to be tempted to sit back and just let it happen. But I want you to know the people who come into the church as teachers, as leaders, and they begin to, to pervert sound, and I just mean twist, I don't mean anything crazy sexual, twist, the, the sound and right doctrine, and turn it into something else, they are conceited, they're puffed up, and they don't know a thing. Which is, if, you, <laughs> if you're a pastor, and this is like one of the last tools in your toolbox is to pull out the hammer that goes, you're ignorant, whack, you know, stop, you don't know, you don't understand what you're doing, whack. And that's what he says, this is what these people are, they're puffed up with conceit, they understand nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. There it is, right there. He's just put his finger on. Now he's talking about the character of the kind of people who do this. The character of people who come in and start changing things, who start teaching something a little bit different, and it's all this still, no, 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 yes, we still need to be good people, we still need to serve, we still need to, but the why begins to change, and it benefits the leader who's teaching this new thing. Because true Christianity, being a pastor in true Orthodox traditional Christianity, means your head's on the chopping block first. It's not like, well, hey, I get to milk everybody for money and stuff, and they all got to come to me and respect what I say, and they're going to put me on a pedestal, and that's why I want to be a pastor. That's why I want to be a leader, a teacher. No, 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 no. You're getting it all wrong. Once people start doing Christianity for gain, the, the gig is up. The, the, the motor's been taken out of the boat. The sails have been torn down. The oars are all broken. You're just being driven by the wind. And shipwreck is coming next. Because these leaders think 
that godliness is a means of gain. Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Beware of pastors and leaders in the church who are looking around going, you guys aren't enough. I need something a little bit bigger, better, flashier, more. That's what I need. I need to do things to make sure my church reflects the, 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 the content of, of my abilities, my gifts, and it's being wasted on y'all. I need to gain. And he says, no, 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 you need to be content. A pastor especially needs to be godly and content. And now he's going to sort of teach Timothy about, look, we brought nothing into the world. We can't take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. As soon as we start turning the gospel of the church, the purpose of the church, into, well, what, is, what, is, what are we even doing? What is this about? As soon as that answer goes, well, me, of course. That's what it's about. It's about me. Like, it, or it's about you. It's about, you come in, I come in, and it's, all, it's about me. Uh, you are here to make sure I feel good, to make sure I feel built up, to make sure I have what I need. I'm here for you to make sure you have what you See how all of a sudden, well, then all of the arguments for why even bother with the church is like, well, if it is all about you, I don't know, if you don't feel like coming, don't come. You don't feel like giving, don't give. It's all about you. What's good for you? You don't want to serve, don't serve. In fact, let's gather up some people to come and serve. Come serve me. Because I would really like that. A bunch of people coming and serving me. That sounds like a good purpose for the church. I would like that. And that is a temptation, not just as a pastor, but just as a person who engages with Christianity, with the church. It's easy for the church to not meet up with our expectations. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. Paul says, well, hang on a second. You're not going to be bringing anything out of the world, Timothy. All this extra credit that you think you're, that's, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, we actually have nothing, everything that we have, every little bit of it, God has given. See, actually, the first defense against the perversion of doctrine is contentment. It's contentment. Because, uh, see, I heard this interview. I don't know if this is true. It's certainly not out of the Bible. It was a guy who claimed to be from, uh, like, the Church of Satan or whatever, and he was like, oh, yeah, we had missions um, that we would be assigned. And, and so, actually, I was assigned a church, and I went into the church, and it was my job to try to destroy as much of this church as possible. So you want to know, want to know what he did? He was really, really friendly with people, and he complained about everything. He would complain about the coffee. Oh, this coffee isn't very good. Oh, the, the, oh, that preaching isn't very good. Oh, wow, the worship was really not very good. Hey, you know, my home group, is just, the people aren't very good. He would just complain and complain and get people to listen to his complaints so that they would start to feel a sense of discontent. And then they would be able to go to the church leadership and say, hey, we got we to gotta start getting better coffee, you know. We're not representing our church very well if we have this really terrible coffee. And hey, we need to start uh, getting better worship. The musicians that we have, they're not very good. We've got to get better musicians so that when people come in, they can really feel the spirit because the musicians are good enough. And maybe we need a pastor, you've got to work on your preaching. It's just not quite. There are people who aren't really getting the message. Could you change the way that you're preaching to? And by, by instigating discontent, he could destroy a church. That's what he claimed. And I'll just say, I'm not sure if that particular story tr is true, but I know that matches up perfectly with what Paul is telling Timothy here. The first thing you need to do as the pastor is be content. Teach that to your people. And if people are coming in and they're not content, but their aim is gain, that's what their aim is, get them out. Don't have anything to do with that. Why? Because if what person is focusing on is personal gain, they are going to fall into a trap, not set by the Almighty, set by the devil himself. And it starts with discontentment. Those who desire to be rich, this is verse 9, 
fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What? Ruin and destruction? For wanting a little bit more? I mean, come on, Paul. Who do you think you are? An apostle? Oh. Maybe Paul actually has just seen this work out so many different times. You know how many sub-leaders were underneath Paul? How many people Paul raised up and installed as pastors and bishops? He's seen all kinds of people. He's worked with the Holy Spirit, but it looks like God's doing a work in your life. Great, let's get you into serving. And he just knows by experience, if you're trying to gain, you are going to plunge yourself into destruction. Because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And yes, I can tell you, I have been a broke young person before, and now I am a rich old person. Uh, and so like, I, can tell, I know what it's like to be pressed up against a wall with no options, no money, and really deeply desiring to, I got to pay my bills, I got to have, I want to take my girl out for a nice time, and you start looking, and your boss is like, hey, we're paying overtimes on Sundays, and it's like, hey, that's gonna, like, I need, it's hard to say no to a little bit of gain, because honestly, like, we need it. And like, I, I totally get it, and nobody will get any judgment from me, but I just want to tell you that Paul is saying, but I want you to turn your mind to something else. Because, because if you can't answer the question, hey, what are we doing? What are we even doing? We as a church, we as Christians, what are we doing? Are we just trying to work on personal habits that are bad? Hey, gee, you know, once, once I get enough Jesus in my life, I can quit smoking and, and then I'll be taking that next level up in holiness, and God's going to work on me for years and years. I'm going to labor about laying it down. We're going to have many, you know, outcrying times of this and that. And then finally, finally, 10 years from now, I'll make that step of maturity. It'll be a great victory. And then God, I'm sure, a few weeks later, will be like, now let's work on your eating habits or something like that. And like, sure, I'm, ter- I'm sure by the time I'm 95, I will be so pure and holy, driven, no bad habits. But that is not the, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. That's not what God is doing in the world. He's not getting people to drop their bad habits. He's not getting people to be a little bit nicer to their neighbors. He's not getting people to, you know, participate a little bit more in local elections. Is it, that's not what God's doing. What is God doing? God is waging a righteous war against the devil. That's what he's doing. We are fighting against the powers of darkness. That's what we're doing. That's why you're important. That's why I'm important. That's why all of the things are important. We're at war. And if you don't see the war, if, you, if you're a part of a military that's a peacetime military, Does it matter if you go out on weekend exercises? Does it matter that you're, you know, in shape and whatever? You could spend your 20 years in the military just showing up a little five minutes late with a bag full of donuts and type on your computer a little bit. Your boss is like, great, you've done your thing and you can go home. It's like, yeah, a military that's not fighting is like, who really cares about? But that's not you. That's not me. One of the names for uh, Jesus in the Bible is the Lord of hosts. Hosts meaning armies. He's a commander of armies, and we're in the army. And so, so it starts with, hey, there are people in your church who are going to start trying to move the what are we doing into better living, you know, uh, getting uh, your your marriage tuned up, uh, getting your parenting style dialed in. Um, you know, really learning how to be pleasing to people at your employer so you can make good money and get a promotion. As soon as you start, not that Christianity can't affect those things, of course it does. Much of the New Testament is instructions on how to be a husband and a wife and an employer and all of that kind of thing. But, but, But that can't be the what we're doing. If what we're doing is just being nice, what do we need Jesus for? What do we need, what do we need the church for? What do we need scripture for? Uh, That's not what we're doing. We're fighting. 
So in verse 11, Paul says to Timothy, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. As for you, who are you? You're a man of God. And I don't know, he might have been writing to Timothy when Timothy was like, I, Timothy, a failure, comma. Nobody likes me, comma. Totally ineffective, comma. Those aren't the thing that Paul's accessing here with who Timothy needs to be. He says, you, man of God. And so I just want to address you as men and women of God, children of God. Flee these things. Flee these doctrines that make your faith about something other than what it should be about. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight it. So I was just sort of thinking about what is that? Do all of these things, which if you, if you look at, Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. They kind of just look like things that I'm kind of working on me on. You know? Habits. I want to get into the habit of of being godly. The habit of being gentle. The habit of being steadfast. No, actually, these things are the fruit of the Spirit being at work in you. When you are a person of God, a temptation doesn't work on you. You're like, get out of here, temptation. And anger and jealousy and envy, that doesn't work on you. What do I need to be envious for? I'm going to be happy for the person who something good has happened. Why? Because I'm a, I'm a man of God. God lives inside of me. He has redeemed me. I once was dead, now I'm alive. This is a sort of contentment, a sort of godliness that comes out of being one with the Lord. And so fight the good fight. It was like, uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, let's say somebody comes in, into the room, some, somebody that you know, and they look at you and they say, hey, you better sit down. Uh, they're sort of like, uh-oh, what, what bad news? What, because they're telling me I need to sit down because otherwise when I hear whatever's coming next, I'm going to just fall over, right? So now imagine that you've sat down and that person looks at you and goes, you know what? You should lie down. Lie down. That would be like, oh my goodness. This, the zombies must be, must be scratching at the door. Uh, everybody I, I know is, if I'm being told to lie down, to sit down, to lie down. But you know, sometimes uh, we get into a situation where somebody says, hey, you need to stand up. You need to stand up. And basically, uh, to me, what they're saying is, hey, you're kind, of, you're kind of being too passive. You need to stand up, say something, let your voice be heard, do something. Uh, don't just let what's happened to you just happen to you. Stop just being silent and being a doormat. Stand up. But of course, if someone, is after they said, hey, stand up, if they looked at you and they said, fight, you got to fight. But it's like, well, this isn't just standing up and making my opinion. This is wadding up my fist, flying into the hallway at the zombies that are scratching at the door. Yeah, something like that. This is what Paul's getting to here in 1 Timothy to this pastor who is trying to pastor this church. All of these things seem to be kind of going wrong. And he's saying, you, man of God, have the character qualities of the spirit moving in you and fight the good fight. Fight. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many, many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Uh, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Then he has all of these other things, and all of these other things are basically like, and I mean it. I really, really mean it. I, and I'm telling you this not just as a friend. I'm telling you this as an apostle. I'm telling you this in accordance with what Jesus himself, remember Jesus, 
when he was being put under the question by Pontius Pilate, all he had to do was just say, when Pilate said, are you indeed the king of the Jews? All he had to say was, it's actually kind of a misunderstanding. There's been a grave misunderstanding here. Uh, like, when you say king of the Jews, what you mean by king of the Jews is not what I mean by king of the Jews. Have you read our scripture? Can I take you to the scroll of Isaiah and tell you some prophecies about what the son, that's all Jesus had to do. All Jesus had to do was just obfuscate a little bit, just do it. But when he said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, I am. Just what you've said. You've said it. That's me. He knew what was coming next. The whole crowd outside knew what was coming next. The apostles who had run away, they knew what was coming next. Jesus knew what was coming next. But he made the good confession. Hey, Timothy, man of God, why aren't you fighting the fight? Why aren't you standing? Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you, when push comes to shove, why aren't you taking a stand and saying, no? That's not no. And like, when you do that, you're keeping the commandment to fight the good fight. You're keeping that commandment. Now keep it unstained until Jesus comes back. That's what we're doing. That's what the church is doing. We're keeping the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was Jesus himself who handed the baton to Paul. Now Paul's running around the track and he's handed it off to Timothy. Timothy's running around the track, he hands it off all the way down to this present day. And hey, you're being handed the baton. You want to be the person who goes, you know what, what are we even doing here? Why are we even running around this track again and again? How do I even know there's going to be someone on the other side for me to hand it to? No, I'm going to take this baton, walk outside of the stadium, go eat lunch, maybe go hit the clubs, something like that. No, 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 no. There has been a long chain of people and it ends. Somebody's going to be carrying the baton and they're going to hand it to the Lord Jesus Christ on his return. Hey, we've been fighting this good fight, running this race. Boom. There you go, Jesus. That's us. That's what we're doing. So 1 Timothy chapter 6 is what's written when Christians just become a little too passive. When Christians see what they're doing as, um, look, we're being kind, we're making things happen, we're serving, we got a soup kitchen, we're helping. Uh, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and my thing is just being really nice, being really good because I'm a Christian. So if scripture is super clear, why would there be a temptation for Timothy to just be passive and let some things happen? Well, it's not Timothy alone. Let me read to you from the book of Jude. Uh, again, verse 3. Jude says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our Lord God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the whole rest of the book is Jude describing what these people are like. I'll call them creepers because they have have crept into the church and they're kind of and they're kind of gross and they're kind of all about sensuality they're all about and Jude says listen i know that they don't look like bad guys they look like good guys you see them coming in the door and you're like a a person in a dry land parched needing a drink of water and these people look like rain clouds and they come in and you're just you're like yes finally we've got someone who knows what's go- who's going to cause there to be rain in this. And Jude goes, but there's no rain. There's no rain. These people just look like rain clouds. Actually, they're really, really terrible. And, and, and so he, just, he, he gives sort of description after description. It looks like open seas. You're sailing and you're like, geez, we've been in tight, rocky places, but now look at this open part. We're going to have somebody on board and they're going to steer you right into a reef. It's going to sink your ship. These people are awful, no good. Don't have anything to do with them. Jude is just writing this and he says, 
I wanted to talk about salvation and write good things about our mutual faith, but I'm just going to spend my whole letter telling you, fight! Fight! Stand up! Do something! Contend for the faith! Contend! And that, this word, contend, is actually the same word that is used for going on a military campaign. So this is not the word that's like, throw a punch and nail that sucker in the back of the head. You know, this is like, no, 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 sign up, train, get, this is a, a full military campaign that's going to last 20 years. We're fighting against a dedicated, we're going to go on campaign. When the Romans went on campaign, they went on campaign for decades. They had to actually march all the way over to where, what, wherever it was, fight a series of battles, <laughs> occupy the place, keep the peace while they turned that place Roman before they could march back home. You could be on one campaign and be a 25-year veteran by the time you got home. That's what he's saying. Contend for the faith. Now, uh, all of these, uh, I mean, maybe I could, Read just like a few of the things. Um, uh, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. Jude is actually quoting here from Peter, uh, in Peter's epistle. It is these who cause division, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Let me boil this down. Jude is saying, hey, contend, fight, recognize the threat first of all, and fight against it. How do you do that? You're fighting first and foremost against sin. You're fighting against doctrine. You're fighting against perversions. That's what you're fighting against. So when someone's in the church going, well, hey, maybe we can compromise on this sort of like, it's okay to be lustful in this area, to be greedy in this area, to be whatever it might. You know what? Actually, if you think about it, greed is good. Envy is good. It makes the whole economy run. It's going to be fine. Say no to that. No. You know that's bad. You know that's wrong. Don't just let them talk and say nothing. You actually need to contend. You actually need to fight. Our, our wrestlings are not against flesh and blood. They're against spiritual things. So you have to build yourselves up in the holy faith. You, if what we're doing is going to war, you want to be jacked. You don't want to go into combat uh, not really filling out your armor very well having to pause and lean on your spear, you know, in the middle of a, of a charge. I'll be, I'll be right up with you guys. Just a minute. Let me catch my breath. You don't want to be, you want to be one of those big jack yoke dudes with the spear who's like 10 feet long. You could poke them from across the battlefield. Ah, yeah, that's who you want to be. Build yourselves up in the faith. Get strong. How do you do that? It's funny that Jude here says, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's what Jude says. You know, Actually, Jude isn't alone in, in that. If you actually just uh, turn back over, I didn't read the entirety of uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Um, uh, but he says, to pray in the Holy Spirit. Uh, find it here in a second. I'm sorry. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. I read my notes wrong. Uh, when Paul is talking about the whole armor of God and, and doing all of that, uh, he says, Take the helmet of salvation, verse 17 of chapter 6. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit. That's what Paul says. When Paul is talking about how do you fight? How do you contend? 
How do you get jacked? How do, you, how do you raise yourself up in the faith so that you are ready to contend with the devil himself, putting out his fiery darts, taking your sword, your helmet, headbutting demons, stabbing all these spirits, making it happen? You need to be praying in the spirit. Jude says it. Make sure that when you're building yourself up, you are praying in the spirit. Now, that is a really important thing uh, because... To pray in the Spirit means that you are making an attempt not to pray your agenda, but to pray God's (laughs) agenda, which is really, really difficult. Do you know what God's trying to do in your life? Can can you join God in prayer for what he's trying to do in your life? Can you look into other people's lives and go, ah, I see what God's doing here. Let's start praying for the will of God in your life. Let's pray in accordance with it. It's really, really, really difficult to do because we don't know what God is doing. But we are told in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit knows. The Spirit knows what God's up to. And guess what? The Spirit's living in you. And guess what? The Spirit's talking to you. And so while you may just be groaning inwardly, ah, God, help me, help me, the Spirit is, is actually listening to the will of God, and then he's interceding for you. He's praying the prayers on your behalf that you should be praying, but you aren't praying because you don't know God's will. Praying in the Spirit is when we say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. I am open to what you want to do here. And so some people do that through praying in tongues, which is where you don't know the words that are coming out of your mouth. It's babbling nonsense, but you believe, hey, this is actually being translated by the Spirit of God. I am praying God's will here. Still don't know what it is, but that's that's what I'm doing in faith. Uh, Other people do it more like a friend of mine said, hey, you want to pray really dangerously? I was like, sure, yeah, let's do it. He goes, listen, we just get on our knees and beg God to do his will. That's all we do. That's the most dangerous prayer I know. And I was like... Really? (laughs) Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to get down on our knees. We're going to say, Lord, we don't know what you want to do, but we want what you want to do. And we're just here saying, Lord, whatever it is you want to do, do it. Why that's important is because it recognizes, it fights against the instinct that says, oh, it's kind of all about me. Let me pray my prayer request. Lord, here's what I need. I need A, B, C, D, E, and F. And if you happen to answer A, I got G, you know? Uh, If you happen to answer B, I got the next letter of the alphabet. (laughs) Thank you. Here's what I'm saying. Surrendering to the will of God is a mode of warfare. It's a mode of warfare. Actually, the problem with the church is our will. That's the problem. And so, like, my will is Netflix and chill. And so it's amazing how much of my will gets accomplished uh, when, when, when that's what, hey, I just, I just need some me time. Have you, ever, have you ever got to the place where you're like, that's enough me time. I need, I need some other people. No. No. No, it's a never-ending deep pit. It is a staircase that descends all the way down to hell. And you think, if I take 20 steps down, I'll be okay then. Actually, what you find is 20 steps down, you go, this isn't enough. I didn't need to go 20 more. And the next thing you know, you're feeling the flames of hell, and you're going, how did I get this far? Well, you got that far by paying attention to what you need and what you want and not asking the Lord, what do you want? What are, you're just being totally passive in your life. Now, again, this is not primarily a problem with the church. This is primarily a problem with pastors in the church. Does anyone here know a very incredibly influential pastor? Maybe one of the most influential pastors in the 1900s. His name was Harry Emerson Fosdick. Does anybody know that name? Harry Emerson Fosdick. Let me tell you why you don't know that name. Why you don't know that name is because he was a champion for the church changing with the times. It was the 1920s. 
and there was so much technological change happening. It's like if you, the 20 years from 1900 to 1920, there's like airplanes, there's like automobiles, there's all this stuff that's happening, this progress, and it was very easy for the average person to go, okay, we were here in 1900, now we're here, what's gonna happen in another 10 years, another 100 years? Actually, we're gonna have robot slaves who are doing all of the things, we're gonna, we'll have no need to work, the entire, the entire world will be turned upside down, we will have utopia due to technological change. Science is advancing faster than it's ever advanced before. One of the problems was one of the main scientific theories was Darwinism, in which no creation event, it just happened, it just came to be, and Harry Emerson Fosdick was like, the church needs to drop this creation nonsense. If we're going to keep up with the way the world is changing, the church needs to go ahead and change too. And there were some people who uh, were like, that sounds wrong to me. Uh, what about the Bible? And Harry Emerson Fosdick was like, listen, the Bible's great. The Bible's necessary. The Bible is primarily a record of how the people of God changed over the years. That's what it is. So we can read it and go, wow, hey, there were some really spiritual people in their day who understood what God was kind of doing, and they made bold changes, and it became the new norm. That's what Moses was doing. Moses was a social innovator who was going in and changing up all these rules, and he wrote down all these things and said, because God told me so, and that's how uh, the, the Israel nation was born. Jesus was a guy who saw all of these people lost in all this, and he was like, hey, I could set these people free from their slavery to all these rules by being really nice and insisting on other people's way until it kills me. And so all of the main things of the faith began to be kind of optional. Well, what do you mean? Did God create the world or not? And Harry Emerson Fostick was like, I think the church needs to start, start saying things like, um, of course God in some way was involved. But Genesis is mostly a metaphorical account to give us sort of the ability to say, whatever happened, happened. I'm sure it was God, though. And Chris says, well, wait a second. You're saying the creation, didn't, you're saying Jesus didn't really die for our sins. He died to show us how to be nice. So that uh, you're saying that the Bible is not God's holy word, but rather a record of how the church has changed. And he said, yes, this is what we need to do. We need to start. And he was just listing out all of these changes. And it just so happened that all of the things that he was proposing kind of lined up on one side of the political aisle. And so, actually, he got loads and loads and loads of money. He was on the radio, preaching every week from uh, his messages. And he wrote this uh, message. It became uh, then a radio address called, uh, Shall the Fundamentalist Live? Win? Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And uh, he made up this term, fundamentalist, in order to kind of smear all of these Stuck in the mud backwater Christians who like wanted to insist that the Bible was actually God's holy word. I was like, come on, we're scientific, we're in the scientific age. We don't need that. The church needs to change. That's what Harry Emerson Fosdick was saying. The church needs to change in order to be relevant. And if we are relevant, we can stay in cultural power. So you want to be one of these fundamentalists who insist that Jesus died in order to be a propitiation for your sin. You want to be one of those backwoodsy, stupid people? Go ahead, but you're going to lose. And the reason that you're going to lose is because you're not keeping up with the time. You're not keeping up with the time. And if you do what we do, that's the reason you don't have as much money as we have. The reason that your churches aren't as nice as our churches. The reason you don't have tons and tons of people flooding into your churches saying, we like this message, is because you're not changing. And of course, uh, this guy eventually died. Uh, he was really, really influential in his lifetime. Uh, but his memory kind of faded. Nobody in the church is reading his stuff anymore. Nobody. Other people have come in, in church leadership, and taken up that kind of message. He wrote a book called um, The Secret of Victorious Living. 
We need to make Christianity about positive life changes. Why? Because that message will sell. And you know what? He was right. He was right. But all of those churches that, that decided, you know what, we're going to change what we fundamentally believe in order to keep up with the time. Guess where they're at now? You think they're full of people who are... No. Because that's the road of compromise. So yes, it works really good right now, but in a generation, dead, gone, nobody even remembers that it was there. I, actually, the basics are the thing of our faith that have power, because it's the Spirit of God that gives us power. And so building ourselves up in the faith and understanding that what we are doing is fighting a war, and it is a war against darkness and evil. So one of the most powerful things that you can do as a man of God, as a woman of God, is to be in the Spirit and to share. And, and to actually say, like, actually, you kind of look like a person with no hope. What's going on? Why don't you have any hope? You know, Jesus promises not just eternal glory, but we can actually be made one with the loving Lord of the universe right now. You ever heard that before? Are there going to be lots of people who are like, oh my goodness, get this fundamentalist out of here? Yeah, there will be. But you know what? The gospel is foolishness to those people who know better. But it's salvation. It is salvation and the power of God to those who are being saved. Here's why us being in a battle matters. Because we aren't the ones who win it. We don't win it. We just be obedient, and it's God's power that makes a difference. This is the opportunity that is before the church today to not just sit up, to not just stand up, but to fight. We will see the darkness being pushed back, being run out of town. We will see many people coming to know the Lord God because it's God's power that sets people free. It's not us just picking the winners and the losers of the, whatever the hot button issues are of the day. Oh, I'm not one of those Christians who believes in blah, blah, blah. I, I, we're one of the, the people who are okay with this and that. All those people, they're going to die, their faith is going to die out. They're on their staircase going all the way down to hell. Uh, but the people of God who understand those basic fundamentals, who understand their salvation, who pray in the Spirit, those are the people who will be victorious when Jesus comes. Paul ends his uh, letter to Timothy this way. Uh, when he says, fight the good fight, uh, just like Jesus did. Uh, he says, keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Again. Actually, in Paul telling Timothy, you need to fight, you need to stand up, you need to fight, quit being passive, get up there, insist on the things that Jesus taught, and contend with the darkness, you will win, but also, you'll be closer to Jesus. And then he just spends this time talking about how amazing Jesus is. He dwells in unapproachable light. He's amazing, he's glorious, he's awesome, amen. And I, I just have to imagine that Timothy, in reading this, has to find some sort of buoyancy in his soul to be refocused, not on what's wrong with the church, not on what's wrong with you, 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 or me, but on who Jesus is, because that's where our hope lies. And Jude, when Jude tells everybody, hey, you need to build yourself up in the faith, you need to pray, you need to reach out, have mercy on as many people as you can, still hating sin, but loving the people who are willing to come back into the faith. This is how Jude ends his letter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. 
to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Jude is doing the same thing that Paul does. Hey, let's put our attention on the one true king, on our true warrior, on the one who has already conquered sin and death and hell, in whom we have victory. And he says, this Jesus will give you victory. He'll keep you from stumbling. He'll keep you blameless because he is so glorious. Uh, May that be our prayer, to be people who are willing to contend, who are willing to fight, who are willing to recognize what we're doing. We're slaying darkness, pushing it back, and getting the world ready for the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, we do uh, need you for all of these things. You and you alone uh, have the power and the ability to cause our lives to mean something. Help us, Lord, to recognize when our own will, our own flesh, our own desires are being pursued and not yours. And give us the spiritual eyes to see you. Help us to run the race in a manner worthy of you, to fight the good fight in a manner worthy of you, our Lord and Captain. And Lord, give us the victory. Uh, We as your people want to see little victories, big victories, because we are submitted to your power. We know, Lord Jesus, that you have already won and that your victory is growing until one day it will be complete. But you have promised that in the last days, many people will rise up, even from within the church, scoffing and saying he's not coming back and there is no victory. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep our eyes on those basics, those fundamentals which are in your character. We pray these things in your name. Amen.